So, um, you, can, you can shout out a little bit here, but what do we think of people like, what, what, what do you think, what words do you think of when you think of Hitler, for example? Obviously a, a, an obvious topic for church on a Sunday morning. Baddie. Leader. A leader? Anything else? A nutcase? <laughs> Misplaced charisma. <laughs> Misplaced charisma? Yeah. What about what about Myra Hindley or Harold Shipman? What about people like that? Evil. Evil people. Okay. Strike a bit of fear into you. Okay? Well think New Testament then. What words come to mind when you think of Saul? Vicious. Vicious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, nasty. Nasty? Yeah. Okay? Committed. He was definitely committed. That's what we're going to look at today. Saul, he was. He was evil. He was a persecutor of Christians. He was responsible for the death of hundreds of Christians. He was responsible for the arrest and torture of hundreds of Christians. He was massively well educated, massively well respected. He was a great leader and he was greatly feared. Okay? Yet he is responsible for writing two thirds of the New Testament. And I wonder, how many times do we really think about that? How many times does that hit home? Because we think of Saul to Paul, and we think, oh wow, he did brilliant things. See what he did, going around preaching the gospel, starting churches, checking on them. Uh, He he was, you know, got himself in all sorts of other. But actually, he was a vicious man. He was an evil man. Yet God used him mightily. And as we'll see in the story in a minute, someone was sent out to meet him. And I wonder if, for example, you know, Hitler decided to become a Christian and God said, Stan, I want you to meet Hitler and I want you to tell him uh, that it's all right, God's got him and it's all going to work out all right. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to be absolutely bricking it and you're going to be thinking there is no way in the world God can use that man. He's not going to use somebody like Hitler. Yet he used somebody like Saul massively and powerfully. Anybody's life can be changed. And Saul to Paul, if you like, even though that's not really the main thrust of the story, um, Paul is his better known, he was used mightily by God. And in fact, endorses our vision as a church. Because actually, he got to know Jesus He then spent time with the disciples and grew in Jesus. And then he went. Off he went. And then he preached the gospel and started churches and all sorts of miraculous things. So he he endorses our our vision statement, which is always nice, isn't it? Yeah. Same with people like Graham C. Has anyone heard of Graham C before? You know, proper hooligan, bad life, you know. I've even a woman at work tells me, oh, I knew him when he was in those days, and I can't forgive him for what he did, even though he's completely changed and a different man now than what he was then. She can't see that that's a new person. And she struggles with that. She openly admits it. She says, I know it sounds harsh and horrible, but I can't help it. Shane Taylor, another one. Big criminal, one of the most six dangerous convicts in the country, yet he was changed, transformed. And do you know what? He also has a life where people still condemn him for who he is now. He still faces persecution now. And there are times like that when we all face it. I've even had another Christian say to me in the last year that they would not trust me as far as they could throw me. They couldn't trust me as far as they could throw me. All right? And that's from another Christian person. And there are things that hinder us, as we've heard this morning from, from Sue, from Christine, etc. There are things that can hinder our walk and our relationship with God. And there are things that can stop us from doing the primary things that God has called us to do. And we want to shake those off this morning. We want to be free of the past, of the things that hold us back and stop us from taking those God steps forward. Because actually, sometimes, for some of us, the past can have great memories, but sometimes the past can really hinder us. It really can. And that's a tricky one to get over. And it takes time. But we can get there, and God has a great plan for us. 
So, I'm just going to read to you from Acts, and I'm going to read to you from uh, chapter 8, very quickly. And just to reinforce Saul's uh, wonderfulness, at the time of stoning, you know the story of Stephen, uh, he stoned, they stoned Stephen to death, and, and the last, uh, the first verse of chapter 8 in Acts, and Saul approved of their killing him. He approved of their killing, like it was a great thing, and Saul was a man who was really well looked up to. And then a little later on in verse 3 it says, But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Okay? It's not a kind of man you want around the team, really, is it? Um, you know, it puts a little bit of fear into you. You know, he's seeking actively to destroy the church. Such a man of high power and high regard needed a change. And that change only came from one thing, and that was through an encounter with Jesus. So I'm just going to quickly move us on to chapter 9. And I'm sure most of you will be uh, familiar. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. What a nice man. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he, as he had neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light flashed from heaven around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And I love this. Who are you, Lord? He recognizes authority over him. That's quite interesting for such a, a feared man. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when his eyes opened, uh, but when he opened his eyes, sorry, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. Interesting that it was three days. And did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias who was going to be absolutely capping himself at this point. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. You know, come on, God, well it's nice to hear from you. What, what, what have you got for me? The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has, had a man, he has seen a man named Ananias. Come and place his hand, your hands, his hands on him to restore his sight. And you can just imagine, can't you? Lord, Lord, Lord Ananias answered, um, yeah, really? Really? Do you really want me to go do this? Paraphrasing, as you can see. I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to, to, to arrest all those who call on your name. You want me to go in the lion's den? Are you having a laugh? You've got to be joking. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he will suffer. He must suffer in, for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. I love that. Brother Saul. He's already embraced him as his brother. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got up, was baptised, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Wow. Saul spent several days with his disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem amongst those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. How ironic! 
But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the gates, city gates, in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lured him in a basket through the wall opening in the wall. What a transformation. What a change. The fact that he encountered Jesus, he spent time with the disciples, and then he went straight away. He's baptised straight away. He's persuading people for the gospel. It wasn't a five-year period, or it wasn't a, he'll take a break, and then he'll come and do all this wonderful stuff. It was pretty instantaneous. <laughs> he was changed in an instant, and that is the power that you have in your life now. You have that same power, the fact that Jesus, the risen Christ, is living within you and has transformed you by renewing your mind and your body. How amazing is that? You have that same transformation power in you right now. The same power that took a murderer, that took a, a thug, and changed him to proclaim the gospel. And people are like, who is this? And some people will be saying the same as, as, as they were then. Who is this Alan Fraser? Wasn't he the one who hated Christians? Probably. Who knows? Oh, there's that Christine Kelly, you know, she's the one who's, who's, who's always been called stupid. We don't want to listen to her, do we? Yeah, we do. We do, because she's been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to listen to Colin, I want to listen to Ruth, I want to listen to Christine, I want to listen to Alan. Why? Because they are filled with the power of the Spirit. They are changed lives. No, we don't want to see you talking. We love you. We do really. The same power that it doesn't matter. As we've read, if you've read uh, Tony's blog this week, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what the circumstance you find yourself in. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the Holy Spirit to change lives. There is power wherever you go. You don't need a plug socket for this. You don't need to charge your batteries. You just need to preach the gospel. It's all you need to do. He takes care of the rest. Doesn't matter where it is. Do it. And I'm saying this as much to me as anybody else, so please don't think I'm just telling you. Because I've struggled with this for years myself. So he's a different man, and he begins to preach Christ crucified. But even still, a little later on, Saul meets the disciples a little later. And even, as it says in, in, uh, in Acts 9, even the disciples were still a bit wary of him. Okay? So, like it said a little bit earlier in the verse, God said, he will know what it feels like to be persecuted. Because if you're a Christian, you will face persecution yourself if you've stood up for the gospel. I'm sorry to say, Christianity and persecution goes hand in hand. I'm sorry. I would love to say that you become a Christian and then it's all roses and happiness, and therefore you're protected from everything with this wonderful shield. But I can tell you this, you are victorious. I can tell you, you are safe, because ultimately, you know where your destination is. And that's what kept Paul going. Because it didn't matter what happened to him, he knew he had an assurance. He knew where he was going. He knew that God had a plan and purpose for his life. So, you will notice when Paul, uh, sorry, when Saul became a Christian, God did not say, become a Christian, and over the next 40 years, this is what's going to happen to you. He becomes a Christian, and then he totally goes where the Holy Spirit leads him. That's his plan. He just goes where the Spirit leads him. And that is the same for you and me today. And it's like I've already said it at the beginning. You know, he did not have the master plan, but he knew to preach the good news. So he went into the streets, he went into the synagogues, he went with those around him, and he preached. Some people became Christians. Thousands became Christians as a result of his ministry. Some plotted to kill him. He was shipwrecked three times, he was beaten with rods three times, he had 40 stripes, he was beaten, he was robbed, he had to travel long distances, he went hungry and thirsty, he led so many different churches that he wrote letters to that we have the privilege to see now, and he was persecuted for his faith. But he did it anyway because he had an encounter with the risen Jesus. 
And when you have a, an encounter with the risen Jesus, you cannot help but the overspill of that into other things, no matter what the cost. I wonder whether that is you this morning, that no matter what the cost, Jesus died for you. He paid it all. Are we prepared to pay it all for him? And I wonder that this morning, and I don't say that as a judgmental question, honestly. I'm saying this as much to myself. But are you prepared to pay it all for him as he has for you? Paul said this in Philippians. Whatever were my gains, to me I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes. To know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. Wow. All other things I count as lost. Because nothing, no thing is worth more than knowing Jesus. Nothing. Everything else is garbage. And I love, I love my little techie gadgets. I've told you before, I love my Alexa. I love, you know, I love Apple stuff. I love all sorts of great things. But the count is nothing compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus. And so you don't need a master plan. You need the Holy Spirit. And he will guide you into all things. All things. You don't need to fear you don't need to have that master plan worked out. You just need to be obedient. That is all you need. That is all you need. That is all you need. And then the final thing is be obedient in there. I recently, I don't know, remember if I shared this or not, forgive me, but I recently started uh, at work. I decided, God said, I want you to do a Bible study group. And, uh, at work and I thought but how do I sell that you know uh, I don't know if people will be up for reading the Bible God said I want you to do it so I asked one or two people and they were like oh yeah yeah yeah, we, we want to do that we're up for that so in the end we, we had to put it before the chaplaincy team the chaplaincy team it's a Catholic school and so the man the, one of the leaders of the um the school, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, we want to, we want to read the Bible. Right, but what does that entail? Pick up the Bible together? Right. We're going to have to think about how we're going to sell that to other people, aren't we? No. We just tell people that we're going to read the Bible, and if they want to join in, they can. If they don't, they don't have to. And uh, we've got to think about the right time. We've got to think about how we're going to sell it. You know, it's got to be worded just right. So just, you know, you know, you know. Don't know, I don't know, actually. I don't, I don't know. But to, to, to start a Bible study in a Catholic school, you had to kind of get it worded right, and you had to sell it right as well. And I thought, no, I don't, don't really. I just want to tell people that's what we're doing. And in my heart, I was like, I was starting to think, I'm not doing this, God. It's just so much hassle. Because I just want to say to people, come if you want, if you don't, don't. But you have to go through all this rigmarole. And I think, oh, I'm not bothered. I'm not going to bother doing it. But I did it. Did it anyway. I worded it alright, apparently. <laughs> By just saying that. And the first week we got seven. And then the second week we got five. And then the last two weeks, sorry, no, the um, on the two weeks we got five, and then the last one we got four. And every week I'm in my heart again, I'm like, ah oh, man, it's only seven people out of 150 ish. What's the point? What's the point in that? 
It's not really much of an impact, is it? But even if it's two or three or four or seven people sitting down reading the Bible together, the words of God are life in themselves. I don't know what's going to happen with those four people. I don't know what's going to happen with those seven. But what I do know is that the Bible speaks to people. What I do know is the Bible contains the words of life. What I do know is the Bible has the ability to change people. So who doesn't want to do that? Who doesn't want to have their, who doesn't want to sit and read the Bible with four other people or seven other people or however many people there are? Because I haven't a clue how much of an impact that will have. And it's so easy to give up, isn't it? It's so easy to give up on three different levels for me, and this is what I found tricky. One is I want to know exactly what's happening when, and you know, um, where I'm going to be in ten years' time. I need to know that. So that stops me. When that happens, I'll be fine. Fear. But what will people think of me? People at work will do say stuff to me. The amazing thing about this Bible study, I've had a few people who've said, it's not for me. That's fair enough. That's fine. How are you, you Bible bashers? This is a Catholic school that's brilliant. Um, you know, I can't, I can't see the few proddy dogs, uh, as he calls me, one of the other ones. Um, and you know, I'm not saying I'm getting like beaten up or, you know, but words can sometimes have a bit of a detrimental effect on you and make you think, oh yeah, you're right, well, it is a bit God squaddy, isn't it? So maybe we shouldn't bother. Um, and the third thing is that, is, is it really making an impact? Is what I do make any impact or is it just a waste of time? Well, the thing that I found out is it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about him. Make him your focus and that's where the change will come. When he becomes your focus, everything else is irrelevant. You just need to be obedient. And amazingly, I've had, you know, every time a new person has come to this group, you know, I, they, straight away the next day, we'll either come and shake your hand and say, I've never felt peace and joy like it. Wow. Great. Not because I've done anything great, because they've encountered God. <laughs> they've encountered God and they've encountered a joy and a peace like they've never felt before. Wow. You know, I had an email that just said, uh, you know, and we were looking at what God's greater plan in our life might be. She said, I have no idea what I, my uh, greater plan is from God. <coughs> but she said, I took comfort last night in the words of the Psalms. God's word is life. God's word is life. I've had two other people email, well, one other person email and say, I'm sorry, it's because it's GCSE season, I'm sure you'll know. Lots of stressed teenagers or teachers around. Um, and so the revision classes have been on, and she said, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to come, but I, I, we've had revision classes on, are you still running it after half term? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Please come along. You'll be more than welcome. And then another one stopped me in the corridor and said, isn't it just for Catholics? I said, no. I said, I thought, I'd, I'd, sorry if I've not made that clear, but it's for everybody. I said, it doesn't matter if you're a Catholic or not, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. You know what? Come along. Because we're just... We're just finding out where our faith is. So I'll, I'll come to the next one. I'll come to the next one. So the next one, we could have ten people. We could have four people. We could have one, two over there. A little stupid, the ones. Um, but I don't know what the end goal is of that. I don't know what will be going in a year. I don't know if it'll be going in ten years' time. But what I do know is I'm just going to have to be obedient to what God is asking me to do. And if it's just for a year or six months for one person to really grasp the mission of God. It's all worthwhile. If this church exists simply for Christine, just to get a bit of confidence and go into the next place or the next church or whatever it may be and be able to fulfill her mission, job done. Job done. I'm not precious. I love this church. I love the people. I'm not precious on it. If God has a greater plan, don't hear me wrong. I don't want to close this down. But <laughs> don't hear me wrong. But if God has a greater plan and a purpose for one person that I don't realise that it's, it's bigger than this church, it's bigger than my work, it's bigger than whatever it is, then it's worthwhile. Nothing that you do for the gospel is lost. Nothing. And like I said, Paul himself faced so many persecutions. But he said this, for I'm already 
being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And that's in 2 Timothy 4. He just says it, just as it is. He will award it to me on that day. Not he might do, or I hope so, or anything. He, Paul has an assurance in his faith that he knows that God is going, he's going to be with God in heaven. He just knows it. He just knows it. And you have that same power and that same assurance with you this morning. So that no matter what you go through, no matter what you do, you have an assurance. And that is Jesus is with you. <coughs> and that you, if you have said yes to him, will be in heaven when your race is done. And so he knew. He knew. So, I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge myself this morning. What is your greatest plan? Are you hopeful one day that you, you may become a worship leader as great as Stan? That you may end up in, uh, in, in uh, leadership in the church? That you may um, pastor thousands of people? That you, I don't know. I don't know. What, but it doesn't matter. You don't need to achieve what you think is the greatest plan. You just need to glorify God and you just need to preach the gospel. And that is something that you can do right now. When I started this Bible study group, I didn't need to come and speak to Alan or Tony. I didn't need to see Alan or Sue. I just needed to tell people about Jesus. I didn't need the authority of my church to do that because I've got the authority from God. And I'm not saying that church authority is not a good thing, etc. But what I am saying is if I'm presented with an opportunity, I don't need to get on the phone and keep asking my leadership whether this is a good thing or it's not. If you're preaching the gospel, I'd say it's pretty good. So I'd say just go for it. What are the things that are hindering you the most? What are the things that are stopping you from inviting your neighbours round once a month, having dinner with them, and, and sharing prayer or Bible study with them. You can come to dinner if you want to. We're going to have a bit of a Bible study. If you don't want to come, that's fine. But what's going to stop you from inviting those people? What's going to stop me from doing, from doing that? Probably my dog from eating all their food. Or my four-year-old trashing the place while we're trying to do something productive. Probably be my thing. What stops you in your workplace to say to your colleagues, I was at church on some days, you know what? I encountered God. <laughs> or I want to start a Bible study at work. Or I want to start a prayer group at work. Or whatever. What's stopping you? What literally is stopping you from going out when you were in the shops and maybe see someone hobbling on their legs and thinking, I could pray for that person. I could ask for healing. Mind blowingly scary. Absolutely. I don't deny that. Am I brave enough to do it? Not very often, if at all. <coughs> I'm speaking to myself as much as anybody. But that person might miss out on the encounter of Jesus because of our fear. And yes, there are times and places for things don't again get me wrong. But if it's fear that stops us over God saying, do it. And that's something we need to overcome. The only way that we will see the kingdom grow, the only way we will see the church grow, is that each and every one of us gets on that mission bus and preach the gospel. Each and every one of us. You don't need a leader's permission to do that. You don't need to wait till the church has grown to 50, 60, 70, 80 people to do that. 
you can do it whenever, wherever, because we live in a free country as well. Don't forget we have that privilege. We have the privilege of being free. And like I said, there's sometimes a time and a place to be sensitive with people. But do not let fear stop you. Do not let fear be your overriding circumstance. And don't let your bad situations make you think that God cannot use you for good. Because he can use you in all things. If he can use somebody like Paul, he can use somebody like me. And he can use somebody like you. Like Paul, you've just got to be obedient. So I wonder if you just close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to visualise in your heart what it is that stops you from the greatest mission that there is, which is proclaiming the gospel. What is the one thing that stops you? Is it things from your childhood past that we've heard about this morning? Is it fear? Is it actually that if we step out, God won't do anything? Is it image? Like, I don't want to look bad or I don't want people to think badly of me. Is it persecution? I don't want people making fun of me. Is it you're in a bad situation yourself now and you're waiting for that bad situation to pass so then you can go on and do whatever it is God is asking you to do 